I'm here tonight because I'm a designer who's trying to implement uh, a circular economy and to use materials more sustainably in construction. Um, and it's an incredible challenge to do this in a world that still operates very much along straight lines. This evening I want to explore the idea that London is full of materials that we can and should use for construction and repair and to consider how we can do this sustainably by thinking of the city as a forest and by building according to the seasons and the limitations of the landscape in which we live. London is a forest city with a scattered canopy of 8.4 million trees covering more than a fifth of the capital. The urban forest is greatly valued for its ecosystem services and a plan for its care and management has been drawn up by partners including the Mayor of London and the Forestry Commission. It's not an ancient woodland, though there are many undisturbed parkland remnants and at low tide, at Rain and Manirith, the woody skeletons of a submerged Neolithic forest emerge from the mud of the Thames estuary. But London now is a man-made open forest of street trees, parks and gardens, railway sidings and scrubby woodlands of surprising diversity. But a forest is more than just a collection of trees and green infrastructure. It's a dynamic, structurally complex ecosystem and a cultural landscape. It contains a community of living creatures interacting with one another and their environment. Consider the components of a forest system the canopy, the ground layer, the rooting zone, and the abiotic non-living layers of the forest, the underlying subsoils and the geology. If we make another imaginative leap, we can think of the abiotic layers and the material characteristics of the built city as we would think of the geographical features of any other forest landscape. And we can recognize that the living creatures that must live in symbiosis with this environment are human communities, as well as non-human, non wild and domesticated fauna. So the high canopy of London does not just consist of veteran street trees like the London Plains along the Mall or the Indian bean trees of Limehouse, but also the bristling stands of steel that support the glass towers in the square mile and the concrete high rises in Brentford. Or those steel trunks and boughs that arch across the retail centres of the outer boroughs. Decaying veteran staghead trees in Hampstead Heath and Lesney's Abbey Wood have straight-edged cousins, the standing deadwood contained in the frames, rafters, joists, floors and st stairs in the terrace streets and the semis of suburbia. The city floor lacks the rich hummus of an undisturbed woodland and leaf litter gathers along the concrete curbs but it's swept away with the drifts of domestic rubbish and commercial leftovers, <laughs> accumulating in ants' nests like household recycling centres and landfill hillocks. Tree roots sequester where they can through dusty soils diffused with rubble, pushing against layers of asphalt and concrete and stone, winding around service pipes and electric cables. Foundation pile borers venture deep below development sites to reveal nutrient-rich, soft, sticky London clay subsoil beneath. The geology of London is the most curious layer of the forest. Ancient settlements were built on chalk outcrops and gravel terraces along the Thames, which later became city neighbourhoods. The subterranean geology is just the beginning, because over the centuries new strata and deposits of building stone of astounding diversity have been accumulating above the ground, set on a bedrock of concrete pushing high into the forest canopy. Kentish ragstone, Portland stone, Cornish granite, Yorkshire limestone, Welsh slate, Italian marble, Norwegian quartzite, Indian sandstone. Not to mention the crushed and fired limestone and clay that make up the ubiquitous super high carbon edifices of concrete and brick. These are the material assets of the forest city. And whilst they're locked into parks and gardens and homes and workplaces and streets and landmarks, there may occasionally be opportunities to intercept these resources when they become functionally redundant and to reclaim them as forest city products. Of the two million tonnes of de demolition waste, or demolition wood waste, that is, collected yearly in the UK, perhaps 10% of this will come from the capital. London generates 9.7 million tonnes of waste from construction and demolition every year, including clay and gravel subsoils from excavation, 
and mineral waste of stone, brick, concrete, and asphalt planings. And these materials are not perfect, but they are precious. We've come to think of our cities as urban islands, remote from nature. The conditions and consequences of destructive extraction, monocultural production, and corporate colonialism are out of sight and out of mind, although we increasingly feel their ominous reverberations in our climate and human conflicts. It's heartbreaking to think of the thousands of tons of valuable resources extracted at such great expense to people and planet, being spirited away every day from London to be carelessly burnt in energy recovery or to fill holes in the ground. I want to stress that I'm not suggesting clear felling the forest city or strip mining the housing stock to extract substandard products with which to continue business as usual. It's instructive to think of our own city as a forest landscape because it makes it easy to see how quickly we could destroy it if we consumed the resources as, though, as we do those of landscapes elsewhere. The city forest can't provide for anywhere near all our material needs, but it's rich with physical resources, which if managed respectfully and carefully can help citizens to shape and repair the city and reconnect with the material world. None of the forest city's material products come in neat standardized packages. They're misshapen, they're often dirty and muddled and unpredictable in their availability. And the conventional sequences of architecture and construction in Britain are linear and unsympathetic to this chaos and the constant revisions and cycles of the forest seasons. Contract completion dates, time penalty clauses, planning applications and fear of financial risk force a relentless full summer of building. The scale and specialism of current tools and infrastructure don't enable the attentiveness or sensitivity or deep understanding of materiality required to craft a good product from the forest city's inconsistent harvest. Being present to the changing landscape and its fleeting opportunities is a human skill. There will be technological advancements that will help us to efficiently transform some of these imperfect materials at scale. But cultural change within the construction industry and in the aspirations of our citizens is a critical counterpart to these developments. We need a different way of thinking about our relationship with the living land. In the past, building with the seasons and living within the limits of the land surrounding you was an obligatory response to scarcity. If crooked timber from stunted trees is all you have, then that's what you must use. And if you can't harvest every year to guarantee the health of future crops, then you must wait. And this is not a wistful looking back to an archaic, rustic way of life but a search for wisdom and material logic and a more sympathetic outlook. An opportunity to critically reassess and improve upon past practices. Material shortage is, after all, a contemporary condition and a seasonal, seasonal variability even more so. These conditions can be drivers of the innovations and vocational discipline of the future just as much as they were in the past. To work effectively with natural cycles is to take advantage of opportunities that, as they arise, using the least amount of energy. Warm wind dries green timber. Morning dew separates hemp fibres. and Ice splits stone. Lump and clay breaks down in winter weather. Production and construction are not then constrained by living processes and events from which we are isolated and separate, but through concerted engagement take maximum advantage of them, letting time and weather do the hard work. The seasonal landscape isn't just a resource to be exploited, but also an instructor on how to live well and prosper within planetary limits. So what can we do in practical terms? I don't pretend to know all the answers, unfortunately, but I have learned three lessons from observing the forest city landscape and working with its haphazard materials. The first is about time. We need to think of the timelines of construction as cycles of varying tempo and of development as incremental rather than final. If we're generous with our time in preparation for the upcoming seasons, then we can be alert and ready to respond when the inevitable windfalls arise. We can make best use of a seasonal glut or a steady stream of small batches 
by allowing space and time for careful collection and sorting, testing, processing, and accumulation of arisings in a secure store of materials. And when we design, we must think of the past and future, as well as present generations of inhabitants, and of the materials of our creation as outliving us all. The second lesson is about tolerance. We need to embrace the crude imperfection of the materials available to us and create systems with greater tolerance for variation in dimension and quality. Rather than complacently reaching for off-the-shelf products, we can adapt our designs in response to available materials. A one-of-a-kind ch curved chestnut limb rejected by the timber mill is transformed by the canny builder into a strong wind brace. There is beauty to be found in the irregular patterns and colours of reassembled and carefully crafted offcuts and rubble. The materials and artefacts of the seasonal landscape are rich and diverse, and their complexity is a source of ecological, economical robustness and resilience. The last lesson of the seasonal landscape is about care. The cash-strapped public client can be encouraged to spend less capital on zero maintenance, indestructible high-carbon stainless steel and concrete solutions, and set aside more revenue for cyclical care of less robust materials and for repair of existing things. Machine energy can be reduced and carefully, tactically combined little and often with well-paid human labour, creating an increase in land-based jobs for the capital. This approach values lived experience, close observation and deep understanding of materials and environment. Those who live in a home built in the spirit of seasonality will benefit from a growing connection to place, as the fabric of their homes speak quietly to them of their landscape origins. So what do we have to gain from all of this, <laughs> as well as the enormous benefits of reducing our carbon footprint and our impact on the wider environment? Well, the reward for embracing the limitation of the seasons is take, and of taking our time and tolerating imperfection and caring for what we already have is a life-affirming, reciprocal, equitable, daily working relationship with the land, other non-human beings, and our own communities. Thank you. Thanks, Loretta. That was really good. And thanks, uh, Simone. So I'll, I'll introduce you to the rest of the panel, and then we'll have a chat. So on the far left to you, this is Clarissa Kalian, who's a project manager, but also has been very instrumental in Extinction Rebellion. And you'll see some slides where you see her in a sailor costume on a pink boat. And she'll be talking about um, the protests around retaining trees at um, Highbury Corner. And then we've got Neil Chassot, who's the head of the London School of Architecture and an architecture historian who's been working on the history of the um, RIBA, 66 Portland Place, you know Larissa, and uh, Loretta, and then there's Sebastian Cox, who is really extraordinary because he's a um, furniture maker, but he also owns and manages its own woodland, and the furniture that we're sitting on and the tables are all made by his um, studio here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and also he's been collaborating with Jay Ahn, who is also an ensemble of the choir, actually, but hasn't been singing because his voice is a bit poorly today. And he's a um, director at uh, Studio Weave, and um, so these two have been collaborating on the Liebich Library, um, which was reusing um, a lot of local timber, which is very relevant to um, what Loretta was saying. So we thought we'd start with the two of you and wanted to ask Sebastian to explain a little bit more about how his studio works and how you make these chairs and why you work locally with your own timber. Yeah, um, thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, so I'll start with why, I guess. Um, <clears throat> we sort of look at local <clears throat> on a kind of national scale. Um, I'm really interested in the fact that since the Second World War, um, woodland cover in the UK has doubled, but biodiversity within woodlands has decreased, which tells us that planting trees alone and increasing woodland cover um, isn't enough for the wildlife uh, that needs to live within it. Um, the, 
thing that we need to be doing is managing woodlands in order to create habitats as well as materials. Um, the other sort of statistic that kind of sits behind why we do what we do is that <clears throat> in the UK, by some measures, uh, we import 90% of the wood that we uh, use here. Um, some measures say 75%. Um, but certainly we're, in terms of volume, and this is not percentage, this is literally volume, we're only second to China. I would love one, thank you. Um, we're only second to China in terms of import volumes of wood. Um, which for a small island, you know, that's a, that's a really shocking statistic. So my business is, tries to sit at the point between those two problems, which is um, actually if we were to use more homegrown material, um, we would actually bring more woodlands into management and therefore we'd be boosting the biodiversity within the woodlands from which we're harvesting that material um, whilst reducing our reliance on imports. And it's worth just saying that on the import front, that's not just like a sort of patriotic thing obviously there's carbon implications of importing wood but also you know um, being a little bit more self-reliant is probably not a bad idea in the day and age that we're in I think the price of plywood last year jumping around the Ukraine war mm. and everyone learning that a lot of the plywood that they were buying before was coming from <coughs> Russia is um, you know perhaps another reason why we should be being a little bit more self-reliant with our materials as kind of Greta was saying as well um, so that's why we do what we do and what we do um, is furniture which um, kind of brings those two things together <clears throat> and intentionally um, acknowledges the fact that the material that we have growing here is by its very nature imperfect. Obviously, timber takes a very long time to reach maturity. It's not a fast cash crop. So um, if generations before us haven't grown it well, we have to use material that is uh, poor in quality you know, on international comparisons. And part of... Um, Part of what we do as a business is try to make that appealing through good design, good craftsmanship, um, and telling that story as well. Um, so yeah, that's the essence. We're, we're based in London. We also have a workshop in Kent, and we have a woodland there too. We have a sawmill, we have a kiln. So we're completely um, all integrated into one business. We can take trees and turn them into furniture. And you're very hands-on. I know when I contacted you around Christmas, um, you couldn't talk because you were doing a forklift. Training. Forklift training, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Important stuff. I'm somehow always on a course, whether it's yeah. chainsaws or forklifts. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I trained as a furniture maker, so I do really enjoy doing it. Um, although these days I don't have quite so much time to do as much of that as I'd like. And why is this, can you tell us about, about this mobile mill? So that, yeah, that you, you may, <clears throat> may have seen it in the presentation, but it's just a small um, kind of version of a wood miser. Um, but we also have chainsaw mills, so we can kind of deal with everything from street trees, like when we worked with Jay um, on Leebridge Library, through to kind of small coppiced wood. Um, we intentionally try to work with everything from a sort of seven-year wonky hazel rod through to uh, we recently milled a, an eight-foot-wide, 350-year-old beech tree, um, which had blown over in the wind, which was an astonishing tree. Um, so yeah, we, we sort of try to work with everything and we try to have sawmill equipment, which isn't kind of commercial in terms of like speed, but it certainly allows us to make use of lots of material that really needs to be used. Can I ask, do people work for you and leave? Uh, do you, are you sort of producing seedlings? Uh, of people? Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> nice, yes. People do work for me and leave, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, was, it, was, it wasn't that kind of question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because there's something about the evening already which is about, you know, what the demography of this audience is. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to lock the doors and make them sign a piece of paper, but I'd love to know really who, every, who are we. Mm -hmm. Uh, how are we interested, why are we interested, and then how do we disperse? Because there's something in the evening which is, for want of a quicker word, is evangelical. And historically, in all the trades, you know, whether you would go back a thousand years or 500 years, or even probably to when I was a child, they joined up. They were, they were joined up by by people who knew other people, who spoke to other people in certain ways. We might disapprove of the structures or whatever, but there was a, you know, there was a man in High Wycombe who sent a bit of a chair to 
Windsor, where it was put on a boat and it yeah. arrived in London and it was called a Windsor chair. It's not a High Wycombe chair, um, etc., etc. The whole of Hoxton, 40 years ago, you walked through Hoxton, you know, you smelt glue and walked through sawdust and, you know, it was a, a gorgeous fire risk. But this is con the point is it's connected. Mm. And the thing that scares me about tonight <clears throat> is that maybe we're in a righteous gathering and we're all going to be doing this, which mm -hmm. I love doing because I like being with people like me. But I'm <laughs> really interested about where, ha the, 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 let's call it proliferation. Mm. What are you asking oh, about our HR policy specifically? I mean, we, <laughs> we, <laughs> We, um, <laughs> I'm feeling defensive suddenly. Um, no, 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 I, I, no. I do take your point. Um, uh, yeah, we have an apprenticeship program, and I think that's one of the things. I think, uh, you know, the people in our business, a lot of them have degrees, but we're making an active effort to kind of look outside of those spheres. Certainly when we've worked with Jay in the past, a big part of what we've tried to do is do workshops which are completely open and try and go into places and reach people. Prior to Leebridge, we did a cool thing in Stratford yep. where we made... Um, and we met in Swindon, of yeah, all the places. We met in Swindon, <laughs> there we go. We did a cool thing where we made something like 60 stalls with various kids from East London over a weekend. So, um, yeah, it's, it is difficult, isn't it? But, um, and I think this industry, you know, lots of industries are very, uh, very narrow, but... Uh, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't finger pointing. No, I no, I'm sure. I was just making sure we all how complicated it is, and actually with a small p, how intensely political it is. Mm. It's I political. Think, I, I think it's just really difficult to use uh, local timber because they don't have certification and they don't come in the right sizes and they're not straight and they have different moisture contents. They might be diseased. You don't know until you <coughs> crack it open. So the clients are, I mean, we try to use the wood on all our projects and local woods for all our projects. But it's so difficult to convince client that it's okay. And that's the first hurdle. Then you have to convince contractors to, it's okay, we'll be able to manage. Because a contract is written in a certain way that, you know, there's a precision is required. I mean, construction is not very precise industry, shall we say, um, compared to other um, in industries, but they require certain quality control. And when you don't have that, well, we do have it, but it, when it doesn't seem to have it, everyone sees that as a problem. And I, I don't know, I mean, in the, um, the furniture industry, how do you deal with that? I mean, mm. how do you get the quality assurance? And, well, and all <clears throat> going back to people, you know, it's actually really hard to even find people who have worked in workshops for years who even know how to use solid wood. You know, so much of the material that we use these days is panel, veneered MDF, veneer ply, um, so, and, and that is like the first thing is like we have to get our own house in order and actually teach the people that come to work for us how to take a wonky piece of wood from the local wood and, and plane it flat. You know, the first, it, we do a trial shift and our trial shift, the first thing is walk over to the plane of fitnesser and show me how to flatten that piece of wood. So there's, there, there is always that kind of question of, um, you know, how, how do you actually bring that all together? And, and as Jay says, you know, there's the, every corner that you turn, um, there's some sort of a, a difficulty and actually sometimes you know, it's like a very difficult business to run to try and do this thing, but we're all doing it because we're trying to actually uh, you know, make a difference and, and improve things. I, I, just for every, I, I wasn't trying to give these guys a half, hard time. I just think uh, we're so badly educated. You know, we're so, we're so stupid. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, it, it's diff I think with Zoom, it's very difficult, but um, Paxton was a gardener who was playing around with greenhouses, and greenhouses escaped into the Great Exhibition. So he wasn't, you know, there are people who would tell you that he was really um, Norman Foster, but in a way he was, but he was a gardener and he was a fingertip guy and he probably knew stuff about he heating for plants and that heating is what escaped into central heating. That's where it came from. 
And I, I just think that there's a way, you know, you, you talk with, there's so much passion, but it's, it's so important to get it to join up. Mm. Um, and I'm not saying you need to be, uh, um, you don't have to go and do the Crystal Palace, but I think it, it helps us if we sort of realize, you know, it's a really weird island, this island, in which this stuff happened. And it's not very long ago. Great Exhibition is just a little bit more than twice my lifetime ago. I can smell it. I might be the oldest person here, but take note. It's, so that in a way, this, is, this has fantastic implications of, pro, of projecting forward to, to the unborn, let's say. I think it's a lot easier now than 10 years ago, right? Um, I mean, 10 years ago is not that long ago, but... Um, no, no, but... Yeah. I, remember, I remember having conversations with a client about um, FSC certification on the local timber as a London-wide. Can we actually do that? So I think 10 years ago, there wasn't any process you could even follow. Now Saunders, I think they, they do <coughs> go into the um, um, tree yards that they actually process London's wood, and, and you can commercially buy them. They're not cheap, because it's craft. But they take a fraction. Yeah. So it's, I think the balancing between what we're really looking for, what you're trying to do is important. You can buy um, Primark jumper. You pay 15, 20 pounds, and you know where it might come from. Or you pay probably tenfolds more than buy something local. Labor cost is different. And a lot of these, it comes together. And I mean, as an architect, you must know exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why it's so important to understand how you can specify things, because it's the same with granite. If we specify granite, we can't say, it's, we get a piece of granite, and we can't, we're not in control if it comes from China or from Portugal or from Scotland, because it's a piece of granite, and the labor and the land that it comes from is completely concealed. It's sort of this um, Marxist idea of yeah. fetishization of commodities. So I think that's really interesting in terms of your practice, how, how you're bringing these things out now. Most of them are really boring because it's all about contract control. Yes, mm. yeah. It's all about words, so how, different how responsibilities. Yeah. And I mean, when we were working in Leibridge, <clears throat> we were gifted because I knew Sebastian and I knew I could trust him. And I drew a very hard red line around the certain elements that needed to be delivered by Sebastian. Mm -hmm. So that conversation took about six months because I needed to get a sign off from the client that mm -hmm. I can do that. And there are quantity surveyors and general professionals around it, very not happy about it. Because you're putting a faith into an individual that mm -hmm. is unknown. Mm -hmm. You can't choose it from catalog. So it's all about writing the contract, wordings yeah. of it. Who takes the responsibility? If your stuff goes wrong, it's my responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> so things like that, you just have to take the risk and do with it. But mm. that's quite difficult to kind of like teach other people to do so. Um, we should probably practically just describe the project a little bit. I mean, it's a public library in East London, um, an amazing building designed by Studio Weave, which uh, first of all, tries, well, the scheme is that there's no tree felled in the, in the park area within the extension of the library. And then within the interior joinery, we, we sourced trees. And we wanted from the borough, but that actually became a bit problematic, so we had to go a bit outside. But I think we used 25 trees. Quite a big one, is that? Yeah, decent size, 600 wide trees. Um, and that filled the library, all the panelling down one wall, which was, I think, 42 continuous metres. Yeah. And then fluted panelling all the way down on the underside. And, um, you know, um, absolute credit to UJ and credit to the council as well for sort of backing a project like that because it was a lot of labour, a lot of work, um, and, but actually it's well used, isn't it? It's a fantastic yeah. public space as a result. It's busy, yeah. Can we move on? I wonder if you can move on to Neil because I think we invited him to talk, to tell us a little bit about why historically we've, we're so bad at using our local woods and timber. And um, you, we've got your slides up at the moment, these black oh and yes. white ones, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I can answer that 
question um, precisely, except to, to, you know, to offer a kind of historical perspective on the worry about uh, how woods were being sourced and how they were being procured and how they were being specified in projects. So my, my interest is in, um, is in Empire Timber, which was a kind of continuous and contiguous campaign promoted by various agencies of the British state uh, between 1920, after the establishment of the Forestry Commission and the passing of the Forestry Act, um, to the, to, into the post-war years. So um, f f for me, that ends. I might actually just go back. Sorry, this won't turn into a lecture. Uh, actually, it could. Um, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, no. <laughs> the establishment of the um, Imperial Forestry Institute, and the image on the, on the left um, shows the Imperial Forestry Institute building in Oxford on South Parks Road, just up the road from, um, from, uh, from Rhodes House. The, 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 so my story kind of picks up, I suppose, a little bit where former phantasmas um, left off in the, um, in the, in the Cambio uh, show at the Serpentine in, in, in 2020. Uh, after the war, after the First World War, um, there was a, a concern, uh, for obvious reasons, that, um, that Britain had kind of uh, exposed its, 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 its vulnerability, its, its reliance on foreign trade, and therefore there were many parallel attempts to, um, to kind of promote intra-imperial trade uh, as part of the kind of broader conception of the domestic market. Um, and for those reasons, um, uh, one of the first tasks given to the Forestry Commission, which was established by the Forestry Act of 1919, uh, was effectively to audit the empire's um, forestry resources. Uh, and out of that um, grew this um, effectively kind of, as I say, kind of continuous public relations campaign to promote um, the use of empire timbers. I'm very interested in how architects, the architectural profession, got very excited by that campaign and, and in a sense, were complicit in the shaping of that market. Um, I suppose the wider context is that uh, you had uh, a Tory party uh, kind of riven between um, free traders and protectionists, if you could imagine such a thing. Um, and uh, this is, this is you know, one of, the, one of the kind of responses of that, I suppose, is, is, uh, to that is a kind of um, great uh, cultural effort to promote um, intra-imperial trade. Um, I should probably just, I'll very quickly just talk about a couple of these images and then, and then I can shut up or I know we're running slightly late. Um, I, I'm quite, just quite interested in the, in the, in the Imperial Forestry Institute uh, there was a whole kind of um, institutional framework surrounding the promotion of Empire Timbers. The Forestry Institute, which um, was kind of formally established in 1924, was one of them. This building was actually opened in 1950, but was a, an interwar project. Um, within the Imperial Forestry Institute are, uh, were loads of um, uh, photographs uh, collected by um, members of staff within the Institute of... Uh, the sourcing of empire timbers or their, their deployment on, on projects, normally uh, on, on colonial projects. So uh, this is um, wrongly labelled um, Isaya Manor House. It's in uh, Nigeria showing the use of empire timbers. There are kind of more, I suppose, problematic um, images uh, showing the kind of racial capitalism powering um, the kind of processing of empire timbers, uh, and they often have, um, you know, slightly um, dubious uh, labels and descriptions. Um, these images, I suppose, are kind of the wrong way around. So the Empire Timber Exhibition of 1920 grew out of the first uh, Imperial Forestry Conference in the ice rink at Holland Park. Um, that morphed into... Um, or the kind, of, the kind of Empire Timbers campaign was then picked up by an institution called the Empire Marketing Board, established in 1926. The, the badge of the Empire Marketing Board and the poster for the Empire Timber exhibition were both uh, uh, designed by the architect and typographer um, Donald Gill, who was a younger brother of Eric Gill, incidentally. Um, and then, I suppose, um, these images show kind of how pervasive the deployment of Empire Timber was, 
uh, in particular through um, government contracts. So the images on the left are showing uh, the British Museum newspaper repository at Collindale, um, where the tables and newspaper stands and bookcases are in Australian, in, in Queensland, Walnut. Um, and then on the right is the, 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 the original building centre on New Bond Street, which had, a, had this kind of circular display of Empire Timbers um, uh, put on by the Empire Marketing Board. And you can see, um, if you stretch your eyesight, the kind of decorative parquet flooring, um, uh, uh, also using those Empire Timbers. Involved in that whole project was, um, was Gray Wernham, who was the architect of 66 Portland Place, the headquarters of the RIVA. Uh, and many of you um, will know the Dominion screen at the back of the Florence Hall, uh, which is carved in Quebec pine, um, but also shows there's, there's a, uh, 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 one of the plaquettes I can't show you um, uh, of, a, um, of a Canadian lumberjack uh, hacking down a, 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 a pine tree. And I suppose there's a, there's, a, there's a whole thing about reciprocal landscapes, which we don't have time to talk about now. Um, I did just want to show, I'll just show, mention these images, because I'm, I'm increasingly interested in um, how kind of networks of supply were um, visualized and spatialized or made material. So not just in architecture, but also in the, in the graphic arts. On the left is um, an engraving by the Anglo-American artist Claire Layton, of the, of, again, of the kind of, um, uh, of lumberjacking in Canada. This was part of a series of engravings to describe the production of paper, um, which was then reproduced in the journal Wood, which was the organ of the Timber Development Association, which played a very important role in, in, the, in, in the promoting of Empire Timbers. And then on the right um, is a poster produced for the Empire Marketing Board um, by Ba Nyan, who was a, um, a Burmese um, uh, artist uh, uh, trained in France, showing, um, again, timber stacking. Um, uh, Burma, Myanmar, was a, a, a very, um, played a very important role, uh, I think, in the um, production and promotion of, of Empire Timbers. I hope that's useful. Very useful, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we wanted, we've invited Clarissa also, and we'll speed up after the break. We'll have let, slightly less people, and we'll be a bit better with timekeeping. But we thought it would be interesting because I think the aim of this evening and of the whole program is to bring in people that are not architects and designers into a conversation around the city. So, Clarissa. Is, I've been talking about, with Clarissa about um, the idea of protest and, and sort of what I learned is that sort of we, I think as architects we probably understand that there's no such thing as one community and there's no such thing as the council, there are lots of different departments. But with sort of protest in my mind it was always, okay, and then there's the activist and the protesters. And when I was talking to her about um, what Extinction Rebellion and other other people did around um, Highbury Corner, it sort of became clear that also there are lots of different interests and levels of organization and aspirations and desires. And it would be really interesting if you could talk to us a little bit about that and explain what you think about this whole discussion from a slightly um, sideways view. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I'm happy to sort of tell a little bit of the story of, do, of what yeah. happened at Highbury yeah. Corner. Um, which is that uh, we, myself and some others who were part of XR Islington were contacted by someone who said, you know, we've been, we've been, there's these trees that are going to be cut down at Highbury Corner and we've been campaigning and, um, and nothing's worked yet and they're, they're due to be cut down sort of any, any day now and we really, we really could use some help, you know, we've been trying all the usual routes of writing letters to the local newspaper and trying to speak to the councillors and just nothing's happening. Um, and so we looked into what, what, what was going to happen and, and there was basically a plan to um, do what's called infill, which is where you have a, a, a tower block, the, the one in this case I think is about 14 or 15 storeys, and obviously tower blocks always have a, a space around them 
And the more that you run out of space, then you sort of go, okay, let's build more, more housing in the space around it, as if the space isn't there for a, a reason. Um, and the plans also included cutting down a, what's called a sort of mini forest of trees that are between the existing, what's called, it's called Dixon Clark Court, the existing block, and Highbury Corner, which is one of the busiest junctions we've got. Um, and, and we looked at that and said, okay, so there's a lot that doesn't add up here. You know, if you're going to build more social housing, you're going to take away these mature trees that are the only thing between people's homes in this junction. So there's something there about air quality. There's also mature trees provide a lot of cooling and, um, and all the benefits we know in carbon capture and everything. Um, and you're going to do this in Islington, which is the most densely populated borough in London with the lowest amount of green space per capita. And as a council, you just recently declared a, a climate and ecological emergency. And none of this adds up at all. So we're like, well, obviously, we have to get involved in this, in this campaign. And uh, so a few of us went and learned how to climb some trees. <laughs> um, and we actually learned down at Euston because there was... Uh, part of the HS2 campaign was, was down there at the time and they were, they were very nice and, and helped us learn how to shimmy up ropes and things like that. Um, and in fact, when, when, we, when we found out when the day was that they were actually going to start the felling, uh, we went in and we climbed the trees and we occupied the space. Um, and one of those photos is me up a tree with a couple of bags. I mean, I was... I was very much in the mindset of, right, that's going to be my home now. So I had water and a bucket and all sorts of things <laughs> with me. Um, it, didn't, it wasn't quite like that because actually there was a, as you'll see in some of the pictures, there's actually a, a bit of a fence around the area and it, it actually turned into a camp that was on the ground as much as it was in the trees and um, uh, it became a bit of a community hub. We had children popping by after school to do little workshops. We had people coming singing, people coming and hanging out, people in Dixon Clark Court and the, and the local, other local buildings bringing us food and hot tea and coming for a chat. Um, and one of the things that became really clear to those of us kind of involved, um, which wasn't just XR Islington, it was, it was the sort of existing campaign group and, and other people coming and getting involved. There's, um, Islington is pretty much all Labour on the council. There's one Green councillor who came along and chatted with us. None of the Labour councillors did. Um, but it became clear to us that there had, even in the process of how that planning had been put in place, there was a, a, a bit of a, a democracy deficit. Um, you know, if you're living in a council house um, and the council come and say, what do you think of these plans we've got, then you know, it's, it's obviously very risky to, to say what you actually think if you fear that you're going to lose your home as a result. Um, so all of this is very interesting learning, and, and the, the councillors, or the, the council, the spokespeople of the council, you know, their sort of label was, well, you're a bunch of middle-class NIMBYs, obviously. Um, so it was very interesting how those different <laughs> class elements came into it. Um, and what was... Really, I mean, uh, yeah, a, a kind of brilliant part of it, but kind of a bit surprising for me um, was how effective doing that campaign was and going occupying that space was, because I'd been watching lots of people who'd been involved in the HS2 campaigning properly living in trees for months on end um, and having real trouble with getting traction. But because we were doing this on a local level, just a few of us being there in the site and saying, yeah, I'm going to sleep overnight in a hammock up there, really, really got the council's attention. Um, and I think they didn't quite know what to do with us for quite a while. They didn't come and talk to us. And the day we went in, you know, the security guards kind of had a bit of panic and called the police, and the police turned up, and one of them said to me, are you all right? <laughs> I was like, yeah, fine, thanks. <laughs> and they went away again, and we didn't see them for a long time. Um, and eventually the council, I think they sent one of their officers to sort of say, oh, well, you, you've got to leave now. And we dug our heels in and said, no, like, 
you know, we, we've got some, we've got some, we've got some demands actually, um, which seem to us pretty simple and straightforward, which is, okay, you need to build the housing. Obviously, social health is a massive need for social housing, absolutely. Um, why do you need to put this building exactly here? Can't you move it in your design a few meters that way so that we can keep the mature trees? Because even if you're gonna plant trees to replace it, you know, a whip is no replacement for a mature tree, and, and this is surely obvious. Um, and we were met with, no, no, it's, can't, we can't possibly do that. You know, it's, it's been approved. The, you know, the planning is just done years ago. We can't change anything. And this is where I kind of really hit the, are you really kidding me? <laughs> you know, here we are. You've got, you know, planners. You've got amazing officers who do all sorts of things. You've got architects. You've got, you know, people who are creative, who pride themselves on, on being creative and you cannot come up with a creative solution to this. If you've declared a climate emergency, you need to review your planning, your future planning, your existing plans, the things that you're going to do in light of that emergency because that's what you do in an emergency, right? You don't say, I'm not going to leave this house because actually I was planning to sit here and read my book. You know, it might be burning down, but that's fine. So... <laughs> So it's that, it's that if you're going to say this is an emergency, then you really need to act as, as if it is and, and actually review these things and, and, and make changes. And yes, that's not going to be easy, but it can't be impossible, surely. Um, and it became clear in the discussions we had, some of us kind of you know, went in to, to negotiate uh, with a council leader and, and one of the other councils. And, and we, we, we really wanted this democracy deficit to be addressed as well. So the way that we worked as a group was that some of us went in for, for the chats, um, but we definitely were holding assemblies with everybody to say, oh, you know, we, what are, are we going to agree to this? Um, and they actually agreed to a whole bunch of demands, which I think... And there's no way they would have been agreed to otherwise. Um, so it was, okay, planting more trees, but planting a lot more trees than they were planning to. Um, they agreed to set up a citizens' assembly. Um, they agreed on having an environmental alliance um, to examine all of their plans and, and look at, you know, talk about how we're going to make this work, you know, your emergency planning um, in, in light of the climate and ecological crisis. Um, and yeah, we got to a point where we, where we made that agreement and stepped out, um, and then a bunch of other campaigners moved in and continued to <laughs> occupy the site, and that was a much longer, more drawn-out thing with tunnelling and court cases and all sorts of things, and they stayed on until February. Um, but what came out of that was there is now an Islington Environmental Emergency Alliance, um, they did plant the trees. They planted 68 new trees, and they've increased their tree planting a lot. Um, and a lot of that has done, been done with a thing called Islington Forest for Change, which was with Islington Clean Air Parents. And that's an ongoing campaign and, and project, which is really fantastic. Um, and there is um, an Environmental Emergency Alliance, which is working closely with the council on their net zero plan and, and kind of aligned with the different kind of working areas. So there's like housing and waste and, and scrutiny even. Um, uh, and the agreement to set up a citizens assembly, that quite has, hasn't quite come to fruition. I think they were trying to roll back on that, um, but then a journalist got interested in it and then suddenly there was a lot of response about that idea. Um, uh, yes, so... Can I make yes. a suggestion? Absolutely. It, I know the patch, personally, I know the patch. And I think it's, what you said is go gorgeous, because there's a suggestion that you penetrated a council, which is, most people have the experience that they're in, impenetrable. And in a way, that's our political moment. You know, we live in this thing called the polis, and we have 
we probably, I would guess, everybody here, if they live in uh, Greater London, they vote for people. But there's not much sense that this stuff joins up. And it's, it, I mean, you're the first person I've met for a long time who, I mean, I would have, I'd have quite liked being a councillor if you came through the door. I mean, it's not my patch, but what I mean is that you brought a particular kind of energy, and I would have thought that it will be of consequence. And I think the point about this evening is that it should be of consequence. And you used the word scrutiny, which I like. Mm. Um, so we're, we're suggesting that we should have our break. Um, you're not allowed to go home tonight without having spoken to four people you've never met before. <laughs> because the thing that makes these occasions so, and I'm going to swear, fucking dull, <laughs> is the tribal zones. The, you know, I don't know, I, can't, I haven't got glasses, I can't see, I can see <laughs> there are a lot of people. But the, the coziness of these occasions and the kind of professional propriety of it, I find personally very dull. And I think actually that is why I'm here, because I think somebody noticed that I'm difficult in the audience. But I'm not difficult. I just want to be a citizen. I like talking to, I'm old enough to have a little bit of late life disinhibition. <laughs> I prefer to talk to people on the bus and know why they're on the same bus as me. It's a city. And we got locked up for two and a half years for quite good reasons. And we're all slightly mad from that. <laughs> and I think this is, you know, what Judith has wrought tonight is pretty impressive. In fact, I'd like you to applaud her. <laughs> But the underlying point is that there's, you know, we're, I, I don't think we should go home just feeling comfy. You know, this is a maple floor. I like maple floors. I'm not quite sure where it was grown. Does it speak Canadian? You know, is it it's pretty damaged? You know, shit happens, etc. I, You know, we speak to the world and speak to not to your immediate neighbor, speak, go up to people and say, why are you here? Because then the second part of this can be actually small p, politically productive. And, and we are really politically inefficient and ineffective at the moment. And you can hear I'm upset. So thank so, you for coming. Yeah.